As the province gradually reopens, keeping COVID-19 in check means knowing who's got the virus and who might have been exposed to it as a result. A critical part of that is contact tracing. With us now to explain what's involved, we welcome in Vaughan, Ontario, Nancy Bevilacqua, public health official and contact tracer for York Region Public Health. And in East York, Ashley Chute, epidemiologist at the University of Toronto's Dalalana School of Public Health. And it's great to have you two with us here on TVO tonight uh, for something that um, I suspect we all need to know a lot more about because this is going to be a huge part of our lives going forward over the next year or two. Ashley, to you first, the job has been described as a cross between Florence Nightingale and Sherlock Holmes. So explain, what is contact tracing exactly? So basically the idea behind contact tracing is that once you have somebody who's been identified as infected with COVID-19, you want to as quickly and as comprehensively as possible, try and find all of the people that that case was in contact with when they were infectious. And the idea is that you find those contacts and you tell them to stay at home, self-isolate, and hopefully prevent them if they are infected from going on to infect other people. So we're basically trying to break chains of transmission and control disease spread. But you know the real key component of this is you need to do this quickly and you need to be pretty good at investigating to try and get people to remember who they've been in contact with and, and, and try and find those people. That's the Sherlock Holmes part. Nancy, I gather it's you and your team uh, who get in touch with people who've crossed paths with those who are confirmed to have had the virus. I'm curious about how people react when someone on your team or you calls them up, picks up the phone, calls them and tells them, um, you know what, you may have had contact with somebody who's had COVID-19. How does that call go? So my role is uh, contact follow-up. So I wouldn't necessarily be speaking to the people that were actually diagnosed with COVID. I would actually be speaking with their contacts. However, we do have a contact um, case management uh, team that initially speaks with the case uh, that has been given the news that they have COVID-19. Uh, that case will then provide all the information that we need as contact tracers to uh, get in touch with the people they've come into close contact with. Uh, so that that information is then relayed over to us, uh, phone numbers, names, uh, perhaps workplaces where you know the exposure may have happened. And that's when we begin our investigation to uh, get in touch with those close contacts. Now, I know many people are trying to live you know, quite carefully so that they avoid those contacts with COVID positive people. Um, you know, just based on your travels and based on your conversations with colleagues, uh, what kind of reaction do you occasionally get from people when they find out, oh, damn, you mean I do have contact? I had contact with somebody with COVID? What do you hear? Yes, so your expression was very accurate. Um, sometimes <laughs> they may have heard that they came in touch with someone with COVID um, because perhaps the case has let them know themselves. Uh, sometimes it is a complete surprise when we call them and they're not aware at all. So you would imagine that they would be quite surprised, uh, maybe a little bit confused about how it may have happened and where the exposure may have occurred. Um, obviously, we have to protect uh, privacy, so we're not always able to reveal how they came in contact. But you would imagine that they would be worried, uh, they might be scared, um, wondering you know, if they'll get the virus themselves. So part of our role is educating them on what to do, the next steps in terms of self-isolation and determining if they have symptoms, encouraging them to go get tested. Ashley, is there a psychological element to the job? Um, so I am not a contact tracer, but I, I think there absolutely needs to be, you, you know, you're calling people up, you're telling them that they are potentially um, going to go on to develop COVID. So, I mean, you definitely need somebody who is able to, you know, provide, you know, not just the news, but also that, that support in terms of, you know, what to expect, you know, these are the things that you can do. And also, you know, in terms of providing social supports and making sure that people are connected and have access to, you know, for example, groceries, or, you know, if you're asking someone to self-isolate, make sure that they have somewhere that they can actually do that. 
So there, there's absolutely more to this than just, you know, finding somebody and telling them that they've been exposed. You really need to provide that support around it. And Ashley, again, based on your experience here, on a scale of one to 10, one means we don't have a clue how to do this and, and we're still trying to figure it all out. And 10 means we're really great at this and we're able to follow up and, and get a hold of it, get our, you know, wrap our arms around it. Where are we in the province of Ontario right now? So in the province of Ontario, I'd say we're probably around a five. And again, you know, the, the, the process of contact tracing is not something new. We've been doing it as a public health measure since, you know, the 1930s for sexually transmitted infections. It's really sort of the bread and butter of public health response. Um, I think the, the challenge with COVID-19 is that we have so many cases. So, you know, if you're contact tracing a handful of people, that's quite different than if you're trying to follow up hundreds of cases. And so the challenge is, you know, how do you scale that up and how do you make sure that you have the people you need to basically start from that first initial, that index case getting diagnosed with, with their um, infection to, you know, rapidly making sure that contacts are found. And so it's not so much, you know, that we don't know how to do it. It's more about the process and, and figuring out how do we scale that up? How do we have the systems in place to make sure that this happens quickly? And so I think that's where we're, we're struggling a little bit is, is, the, is the process. Nancy, I'd ask you the same thing. On a scale of one to 10, where are we right now in terms of having a handle on this? Well, I, I, I would have to say I'm a bit biased because I'm in the role. So I would want to think that we're a little bit better than five out of 10. Uh, certainly, I know that in York Region, when we receive notification of contacts, we attempt to reach them all within 24 hours. And we've been quite successful with that. Um, and especially more recently that there's been less of a lag time between the time people get tested and the time that we're able to receive results uh, in order to be able to be informed of uh, when somebody is confirmed positive. Um, that lag time has been key from the beginning when all of this began uh, and there was at that point a lot more time between the, the time that it took to get tested and receive the results. Now we're getting the results a lot sooner, which means we can start our case investigations and contact tracing a lot sooner. So certainly I, in York Region, uh, as I mentioned, we've been quite successful with reaching our close contacts within 24 hour period. Now, Ashley, it seems a given that once we start to reopen the province, be it regionally or all at once, it looks like region by region, uh, people are going there, there, people are simply going to have more interactions with each other. That seems uh, obvious on the face of it. Are you confident that our contact tracing system is going to be good enough to handle all of those presumably, you know, I don't know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of contact traces that we're going to be doing in the next several months? Um, I, I mean, you've hit on, you've hit on a, on a key issue. So right now, I think, you know, we're, we're still working through how this, how this whole process works. I think in a lot of health units, you know, all of the people in the health unit are working on COVID right now, right now. And, you know, different health units are having different degrees of success in terms of their capacity and ability to do this quickly. But as we relax physical distancing and as people start having more contacts, the job for contact tracers is going to be more difficult. And we're also, you know, we don't want to just completely shut down all of the other operations that health units are doing. So I, I think it's it's really, really going to be challenging. And, you know, part of this is going to depend on how many cases we have, you know, those index cases circulating in the population. And so I think that's why there's been such a focus as we reopen to make sure that we reopen at a point where we don't have a lot of new cases being diagnosed every day. Because as you said, you know, if we're to just say we have 100 cases um, diagnosed today, and each of those cases have five contacts. And a month from now, if we have 100 cases in each of those cases, because they're out and about and doing their normal lives, they suddenly have 20 contacts. That's a, you know, a lot more work for contact tracers to, to do their job. So, so it's going to be a challenge because we have these sort of competing processes happening. And, and I'm, I'm not sure how, how, how that's going to unroll, but I think bringing down the case burden in general in the, in the province is gonna be a really critical part in order to have this be a sustainable um, system. 
Well, Nancy, that takes me back to you because, of course, we've seen the, I guess, the most up-to-date numbers uh, that we have are that fully three-quarters of the new COVID-19 positive cases in the province of Ontario are in the greater Toronto area. And York Region, obviously, is one of the most significant jurisdictions within the greater Toronto area. So you're going to have your hands full. Are, are, are you sure you guys can keep up with all the contact tracing that you're going to be required to do as we reopen? Well, York Region Public Health, we've um, deployed our business continuity plans as well as our health emergency operations centre. So that has actually allowed us to deploy staff from all of public health currently to uh, address the pandemic. So we currently have on our contact tracing team about 18 staff and two managers. And um, at this point, it's been quite uh, a steady flow. Um, the great thing is that we're able to move staff and, and that constantly happens where staff is redeployed, for example, from from um, you know our contact tracing perhaps to case management when uh, things start to ramp up there. So it's a very fluid environment where our staff are being you know pretty constantly moved throughout various teams depending on where the need is. Um, and so I believe that this will will continue. Um, and what we do ask for the public is to help us with contact tracing. And that means that if you are out and about. Uh, it is a good idea to keep a journal, keep a calendar of where you go and who you uh, are in touch with. Always remember um, to keep your guard up and it's most tempting nowadays with the weather getting nicer and we've been cooped up now for a few months. Uh, it's very tempting to think, wow, let's just get out there, but we still need to maintain that physical distancing, try to still stay home as much as possible and keep that journal. It's very key because when public health comes to ask you uh, where you've been, you may have difficulty in recalling uh, the last several days. Maybe you are stressed because you've been given a diagnosis of COVID. That contributes to sort of a reduction in your, your memory. So it's important to be able to recall where you've been because that will help the contact tracers. Well, having said that, Ashley, uh, now I've been told this, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong on this. I have been told that Ontario is still using fax machines during contact tracing. Is that accurate? Um, so I think the fax machines come in a little bit earlier. So, so before the contact tracing starts, we have to um, have communication between the, the public health labs and the health units. And I believe that the, the fax machines um, come into play in terms of that's how some labs are sending information on positive cases to the health units. Um, and, and again, this, this goes back to this, this idea that, you know, contact tracing is part of this larger process. And so when I said that we were at about 50%, I was, I was referring, I guess, more to than just the work that the contact tracers are doing, but more about this, this sort of longer process and, you know, the time from that index case getting getting sick and getting a test until that information getting to the health unit that's where you know we have fax machines and we have problems with systems and and sort of information flow taking a little bit longer than we would like and i think that that's you know really where the focus needs to be you know in addition to making sure that we're doing contact tracing well we need to have the technology and the systems in place to make sure that we're actually, you know, information is flowing in a way that, you know, people can act quickly because this disease spreads very quickly. And if it's taking a week for information to travel from, from, from that person initially being infected until that information getting to the health unit, they could have potentially gone into infect a, a large number of contacts. And if we could do that faster, we could prevent those infections. Well, Ashley, you're saying it far more diplomatically than I think most people watching this would say it right now. I guess the question is, we're dealing with a 2020 pandemic, and in some cases, we are applying 1970s technology to get this act together. I mean, how in heaven's name are we still, how can that be? It's an excellent question. So, I mean, I was working in infectious disease epidem epidemiology during H1N1, so in 2009. And we were having the same conversations then in terms of outdated systems and needing to have improved processes and, you know, the need for, you know, some sort of overarching system so that we didn't have this disconnect between labs and health units. And in terms of, of why that system isn't in place and why it doesn't exist today, 
I, I don't really have an answer for that. I think one of the really interesting things during this pandemic is that if you look at, you know, Ontario was very, very heavily affected by SARS. And if you look at the other um, countries that were affected by SARS, all of them have responded incredibly well to this pandemic. And I think Ontario is the outlier here. And so those other countries really learned from, from that experience and came up with ways to, you know, ensure that they were better prepared. And in terms of, of why Ontario isn't in the same situation, I think that's probably a much larger conversation to be had with people who are not myself. But I, but I mean, it's, it's a very stark, stark contrast. Well, I guess I want to know, Nancy, whose responsibility is it to make sure that we are applying 2020 technology to a 2020 pandemic? Well, I, I could tell you just in terms of York Region again, I think we're uh, doing fairly well. If you take, for example, uh, the week of May 26th to June 1st, we had about 161 confirmed cases. And what we determined uh, through our case management uh, investigations is that of those 161, uh, there were 223 close contacts that were identified. So when you look at the ratio, it's approximately um, two close contacts for every case. Now keep in mind that that can uh, change depending on how many close contacts there were. Uh, but I think if we're able to keep that ratio as low as possible, uh, we're, we're, fairly, we're doing fairly well. Um, and I think that's, that's actually not a bad ratio when you look at other, other jurisdictions, so. Okay, let me do a follow-up with you, Nancy, because uh, Premier Doug Ford has been saying during the course of his public briefings, which he has every uh, weekday, that, um, that he wanted to set a target of public health workers contacting 90% of those that have come in close contact with an infected person within 24 hours of them being confirmed infected. Do we know whether that target's being hit? Well, as I mentioned in York Region, we attempt to contact all our cases. Once we are made aware of a confirmed case or of a close contact, we do call them within a 24 hour period. Um, York Region has uh, been very transparent in terms of the number of cases and the trends. In fact, we have, um, at, uh, if you go to york.ca slash COVID-19 data, You'll see there every, uh, every day at 5 p.m. we update the dashboard with case numbers and trends. Um, and so I think we've been very transparent in terms of, of uh, you know, the cases that have come up. Ashley, um, I think I heard Health Minister Christine Elliott say the other day that uh, somebody somewhere is working on, if not one app, maybe a series of apps that would um, that would do contact tracing. Can, can you give us a better idea of how that would work? Sure, um, so, so there's been a lot of work on trying to think about how we can use technology to, to improve the contact tracing process. And it really relies on the fact that we all, or a lot of us have smartphones in our pockets. And so we can use those phones, who, you know, they have GPS and they have Bluetooth to try and, and track who we've come into contact with and basically use them to try and 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 improve our memories basically so instead of asking people to keep a journal for example if you have a phone and just say um, you and your contacts that i guess the the important condition here is that both you and your contacts need to have this app and what it does is if we're in close proximity our phones ping and so that phone then collects information and if if one of us goes on to develop covid we can use the information in our phones to to identify potential contacts. Um, there's a lot of different types of apps. Some of them provide that information to um, government, so to the public health unit. Some of them keep that information on your phone. And the idea is that you know it's it's more privacy protecting, so you're not sharing that information with others um, because people do have concerns around surveillance and using that information for other purposes. But you know, at the end of the day, the idea is really just how, how do we we make this process more efficient and rely a little bit less on on the person side of things and you know the person phoning you up and trying to jog your memory. Okay, so I hear you on the efficacy of the thing and on the privacy concerns. On balance, therefore, are you pro or con this idea? Um, 
I, I would say that I think I think there are potential benefits to this. I think that the biggest challenge is that you really need to have pretty um, high coverage. So you, there was an initial study that came out of, of Oxford that was suggesting that around 80% of smartphone users in the UK would need to have this app to, to, to have for it to have an effect. Um, I, I, I increasingly think that at this point, any little piece that we have that can help us sort of muddle through this pandemic is going to help. I don't think they're, well, I don't think apps alone are going to, to help us get through this, but I do think that, you know, there's a potential role for this. If it can help people keep track of their contacts, if it allows us to rely a little bit less on physical distancing, I, I think there's, there is a potential role for this, but we really need to, you know, as a society think about, you know, what that app looks like and what we're comfortable with in terms of privacy and in terms of how it's implemented. Nancy, let me give you the last word on this. Do you think, uh, do you think it's more likely that people are going to follow what a, what an actual real human being uh, calls them and advises them to do on the telephone or follows an app? Well, if there's actually two parts to contact tracing, and one of them is informing the contact that they have been in contact with with a, a positive case. The other side of it is the investigation and the health teaching that has to happen around um, that contact. So certainly, perhaps the app would be helpful in notifying the case that they were uh, in contact with somebody. However, we cannot discount uh, a large part of contact tracing is the human part of it, where we actually interview the contact and we provide the health teaching. We determine if they're symptomatic or not, and we uh, inform them of how to properly self-isolate, answer any questions, concerns that they may have, so I really don't feel that an app could be a, a total replacement for contact tracing. I think the human side is still most important. And contact tracing is important not only for COVID-19, but for many other uh, diseases of public health significance. So I don't really see the human side disappearing anytime soon. Gotcha. Nancy, you're going to forgive this very last question, but you know anybody who knows anything about York Region knows that the mayor of Vaughan is Maurizio Bevidacqua. And um, that's a very unusual last name, and you've got it too. Are you two related? We're not related. I do get asked many times. Uh, I think he's a great mayor, and he's doing a great job in Vaughan. He'll be thrilled that you said that. I want to thank Nancy and Ashley, both of you, for joining us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.